Hello there, very good uh, afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us on another Focus Wire Future Proofing Travel. So, uh, very first thing we need to do is uh, thank our sponsor, which is Travelport. It's actually time to say goodbye to everything that's broken about travel retailing and say hello to Travelport Pus, as you will have seen us talking about on uh, Focus Wire the last couple of weeks. It's actually a simpler, faster, and more engaging platform for everyone. Travelport is here to bring travel retail up to date and ready for tomorrow. Uh, you can discover more by going to travelport.com stroke plus. So thank you very much to them. We'll mention them at the end, just in case you didn't catch that uh, address there. So our guest for this particular episode of Future Proving Travel is uh, Emily Weiss, who is the Managing Director and Global Travel Industry Lead at Accenture. Uh, she's been at Accenture we were just checking before we went live on air here for actually over 25 years. So, but don't send her a carriage clock. She said, uh, actually along the way, <laughs> <laughs> alongside covering travel uh, and hospitality, she's worked with the food, beverage, media and entertainment sectors, but she, at the moment, you know, current role, she's all over travel, which means you are perfect. No pressure, Emily, for this particular session on future proving travel today. Again, very warm welcome for joining us, Emily. It's great that you Thank could you. be here today. Thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, Accenture has issued a couple of really interesting papers over the last couple of weeks and months, which is where I've been basing the kind of the, the area of questioning that I thought would be useful for us to dive into, because um, you take a really interesting umbrella view on what, how everything is either operating at the moment or kind of unravels in the future. And there is no better time ever really in the industry to kind of just think about how these things are unraveling and the future because we've been through a fairly tumultuous uh last probably what, 14 15 months now sadly so um we try not to dwell too much on what's happened it's future proofing we're talking about what's going to happen over the rest of this year and into the future ahead so that's kind of where we're going to go with this today emily so one of the papers that you've issued talks about how why the travel business is now a leisure business and it's smaller. Now, that does seem kind of fairly obvious because business travel is kind of it hasn't died a death, but it's very, very minimal levels at the moment. But just give us your definition, if you can, as to why you think the travel business is a leisure business. And the follow up to that, which I'll ask now, is is that likely to change, do you think? Are we yeah, not towards being a leisure business for the long term, possibly? Yeah, no, I'd start off by saying, Kevin, it's a for now. Um, so I'm sort of answering your second question first. But um, the leisure business is mainly because of there's so much still to be seen. It really remains to be seen what's going to happen in terms of, um, first off, even this would impact the leisure business, which is, what's going to happen with government restrictions? What's going to happen in the individual jurisdictions? You know, the vaccine rollout has been great in some countries and not in others. And that's really going to be a major determining factor in terms of what happens with the recovery of travel. And so right now what we're seeing is, is that the business travel has halted um, significantly. But again, I want to stress the for now and the currently um, element of that, because I don't think that travel, business travel is dead by any means. I think it's forever changed. I think the days of me flying cross country for a one hour meeting or, you know, hopping over the pond for, you know, an afternoon, they're probably long gone or at least long gone for quite some time. But in the end, business is a people business. And so I do believe that there will be a return to business travel. But right now, the you know, leisure is, there's so much pent up demand with people not being able to leave their homes, not being able to leave their towns, their cities for all these you know, 15 months, as you mentioned, the pent up demand is unbelievable. And some of the research we've, we've done recently shows that of, I think it was um, you know, of the 10,000 consumers that we, across 19 countries that we interviewed, 46% say that they don't have plans for business travel post pandemic, or if they do, it will be 50% of the kind of travel they used to do. But then you look at the research and it says that the pent up demand from a leisure perspective of the millennials, those who want luxury travel. Interestingly, you know, for a long time during the pandemic, it was let me go camping or let me go, you know, local. 
now there's uh, to the beaches or out in the mountains. Now there's um, statistics that are showing people want to get back to cities. And so I strongly believe that leisure is going to bounce back. I mean, we're already seeing it in North America and that there's going to be a need for the travel companies to respond to this new traveler. And not that a leisure traveler is new, but the type of leisure traveler is new. Yeah. So that's the that's the point I kind of want us to get into. Travel companies almost re-engineer their thinking around that of leisure travel. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to re- sort of think about inspiration of the traveler. So back when business travel was, you know, 80% of their travelers or of their, their consumers, customers, you really started at the booking flow. You want to make the booking flow easy and then you wanted to make that whole process. But now you're going to have to back up in the customer journey and really focus on attracting uh, the, uh, the travelers, the consumers much earlier in the journey. So thinking about what is it that they want, thinking about how do you personalize the experience and, and attract them. That was never really a primary focus for the travel companies because they really, they had the travelers and now they're going to have to demonstrate things around like health and safety and making sure that travelers, instead of it just being a given that you go and travel, that there's actually inspiration or there's a desire. And I can say pent up demand and then say that you have to attract them and they're somewhat at odds. But the reality is, is pent up demand doesn't mean you're actually going to travel unless you have those comfort and that reassurance of health and safety protocols are being in place. You know, you know me and you're going to be uh, delivering a travel experience for me that meets my needs. Um, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into talking about loyalty a little bit later, but, you know, loyalty was always focused on business travelers and it was focused on volume. Now, what does that mean for a leisure traveler? It's interesting. I mean, you mentioned inspiration and I wonder how, how do we inspire people to travel other than telling them that it's safe? Because that should now just be the default thing is that you know your travel will be safe and we are you know we've we've implemented all these protocols and all this kind of stuff but what else do travel companies need to do to inspire people to either get back on the road again or be more discerning with whether they pick product a or product b yeah it's really i think it's going i i like to use the term going back to the basics and so it's really developing trust in the brand So what is our global brand? And then there's also a focus on sort of local global. So I have a global brand and I want to make sure that I give my um, my consumers reassurance that this is the place, you know, that we represent uh, whatever our standards are or that we provide experiences and we're in locations that are desirable on top of the health and safety protocols that you said, which is going to become just, you know, the basics and the expectations. Um, but it's really looking at those local needs. And so, for example, we've seen arising out of the pandemic, the, the conscious traveler, right? The traveler who's focused on wellness, the traveler who cares about sustainability, the traveler who cares about, as I said, you know, the local environment that they're in and being able to deliver marketing and being able to target the consumers with those kinds of messages that attract them back into, you know, their, their properties or back into the air. And the other thing, you know, I, we talked a bit about business travel, but, you know, the new traveler and business space are, you've heard a lot about the digital nomad, right? So is that long standing? Is that right now in the height of the pandemic, or is that going to be a long term where they merge business and leisure together? And are we able to track, attract the consumers back into your properties, for example, to be able to say, I can give you a month long or a multi-month long stay that meets your needs, that isn't just about, you know, having a room during, you know, on a Tuesday to a Thursday. Um, and the other thing from a business travel perspective is about attracting is there's going, I believe there's going to be a whole new population or, or demographic of business travelers that never existed before. And what I mean by that is if we don't know what the future of work is yet, right? There's a lot of speculation and there's no no final answer. But if we genuinely believe that a lot of people will not return to the office the way they used to, those people who lived in urban environments and in the cities, I'm from New York City, so I use this as a great example. People who lived in Midtown, so they only had to walk three blocks to their office because that's where they worked, you know, every single day are now allowed to live 
in the country or multiple hours away from the city in more suburban environments or, you know, mountainous environments because they don't have to be in the office. They may, they never traveled before. They may now have to travel once a month or once a quarter for a week for offsites to be with their teams. Those are people who never got, went in the air. Those were people who never stayed in hotels. So that's a whole new business travel segment that will appear that it's going to have to be accommodated. It's an, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, evolution that, as you say, I think is still yet to, to be defined. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned loyalty, and I, I'm, not t- I'm not talking now about loyalty programs. I'm talking about loyalty to brands. And, um, you know, depending on which survey you read, you know, you know, there would be always different kind of um, uh, ideas and results. But there has been, over the years, an idea that travellers aren't particularly loyal to a brand because it's an infrequent purchase they're often driven by price those kind of elements do you sense that that is going to change that we will become more loyal to brands either because of the way they treated us during the pandemic for example or for other reasons do we sense the power of the brand might be coming back rather than the the value of the price I actually do. I mean, again, I think a lot of this remains to be seen, and it's very different based on the demographic that you're talking to. But trust is going to become so much more important. It's always been important. And this whole question of loyalty is not a new question. This isn't a post pandemic question. This has been going on. And, you know, you said you're not talking about the programs, but programs have been being being explored and reimagined for years now. Um, But I think the trust factor and the delivery and honoring the commitments is going to become more and more important. So if a brand was very trustworthy during the pandemic, and then all of a sudden is now starting to gouge their consumers with, you know, really high prices and not honoring their health and safety protocols that they put in place, Mm -hmm. they're going to lose loyalty from their uh, travelers for sure. If a brand it really upped their game during the pandemic and was, you know, re- made, became more flexible around cancellation policies or around, you know, rescheduling, or as I said, the health and safety and was really taking the consumer into account. Things like personalization actually took into account what was important to the travelers and they hold to that post pandemic. And by the way, they're able to keep their prices in line and, and understand that price is still a significant factor and they're able to offer experiences to their uh, travelers and make it not just about volume and recognize that I've been a loyal frequent flyer or a loyal you know, hotel um, you know, goer uh, for many, many years. And now that business travel has gone down, but I'm still considered important, that's going to matter. But if all of a sudden, because I'm not traveling for business for the last year because of that pandemic, then I just become a no one. That's a yeah. problem. Right? It's, it's interesting. Do you, do you think that plays into the strength of the really big global brands? Because they are big global brands. They get a lot of recall and all those kind of things rather than, say, a mid-level player. I'm thinking of like digital brands now, online travel agencies and things like that. Yeah, there's such a different – there's really two big schools of thoughts on that. So for me personally, yes, it absolutely plays into the big guys because they have the ability to do that. They have those standards. They're able to honor them. Um, we talked a lot during the pandemic about the difference be- between people wanting to you know, do homestays versus big brands. And there's the pros and cons of it. And, and there really truly are just two schools of thought. And I'm not I, I don't know that you can change people per se, like you are either a hotel goer or you are a homestay person. But for me, I feel much more comfortable that a big brand is going to honor their health and safety protocols. It is going to become a no brainer, as you just said, Kevin, right? It's not even a factor anymore. It's an expectation. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if I believe that from others as much. So, so yes. And I do think that they have the volume to be able to do that. Um, but I really think that it's really, it's going to be about the culture of the company. I also care a lot about how I see these travel companies treating their employees. You know, we've been focused so much on the consumer and I understand that that's obviously very, very important, but how are they treating their workforce? Are they able to inspire their workforce to come back to, you know, many people were furloughed and health and safety is equally important to them as it is to a consumer. 
So, you know, you can see all over the press right now that labor is a problem in the hospitality industry, but really in the travel industry at large and the frontline yeah. workers. And I care about seeing, and I think, you know, I talked about the conscious traveler and their focus on wellness and their focus on sustainability. Those are the travelers who also care about how the way these brands are treating their workforce. And are they making it as safe for them to return to work as they are for us to stay in their properties? Yeah. Do you think there's any, or there will be any change in the kind of the marketing tactics that have actually been fairly and consistent used for quite a few years now so you know you've got the big players that will spend previously 11 billion dollars on pay-per-click and performance marketing and then there are those that get their toes in the the social marketing world and influencers and all those kind of things do you think that's just going to pick up again or is there some kind of something a little bit more fundamental around um you know marketing tactics and whether they are going to evolve are definitely going to evolve. I don't think evolve means losing the digital uh, marketing strategies, the global strategies that have been at play. But I do think there's going to be a shift into much more local marketing. And there's going to be the importance of, I think I already mentioned this, but starting marketing earlier in the customer journey. So making sure that it's back at the sort of attract and inspire and discovery phase more than at the booking phase and moving forward. But that's an interesting point because, you know, you ask any travel executive at the moment and they say the, the, the window is incredibly narrow. So that inspiration and um, booking phase might actually be just a week before they want to go, which is not a lot of time for the traditional ways of nurturing a customer and all those kind of fluffy parts of the marketing to come into play. Yeah, which is why when I said evolve, that's where like social media is going to come make a much bigger, um, I believe, you know, much bigger play in the marketing strategy, because that is about in the now and that is in the moment. And that is going to be able to capture that much smaller window than, you know, the more traditional or longer spans of of marketing, um, you know, campaigns. Um, And then, you know, this sounds like an old news. Sorry, this sounds like an old news comment, but, you know, the shift to leveraging you know digital media in a much greater way than ever it is old news in many regards but i'm not sure that you know they it's been fully um you know executed as it should and even just from sort of a behind the scenes perspective of how you do your marketing so not just what the marketing is but how you do it so are you developing you know content production at scale are you utilizing data and analytics to make sure that your marketing is more targeted Are you using, you know, cloud technology to get access to that data so that you can, you know, target your customers in a different way and in a much more rapid way at scale? So I think it's it's both evolving the the strategy and then most importantly, enhancing the how um, that enables all of that. We talked about brand loyalty. What about loyalty because there's a lot of discussion. We had an event at Focuswire here just uh, uh, last month. We were talking about the evolution of loyalty programs. We touched on you know, um, a program that's very close to TripAdvisor's heart at the moment, which is the subscription model. What's your kind of perspective on the way um, loyalty programs have evolved or are evolving, which will cater for this new, whether it's a new type of leisure traveler or business traveler? Yeah, yeah, I I mean, it's absolutely going to, going to evolve because sort of the days of points based, I, I sort of referred to this earlier, and volume, mm-hmm. it's just going to change because very few leisure travelers are going to be spending $100,000 a year on, on the airlines or having 25 stays a year, right? That's just not how leisure works. That's more of the business world. And therefore, when points programs are based on volume, it's not going to work for the leisure traveler in the same way. Um, I think there's going to be a tremendous shift towards experiences. And so it's going to be focused on providing benefits. And, you know, I, when I say benefits, I don't mean like a box of chocolate on your pillow when you arrive because you're, you know, a loyal customer, but it's really looking at things on understanding and back to my point about data analytics, understanding the traveler preferences. So understanding things like, you know, early check-in, late check-out um, preferences in terms of, you know, I want my room at the corner away from the elevator, you know, really looking at that and then expanding even more broadly in terms of other elements f- 
from during this stay. I think there's also going to be some form of um, simplification. So right now, you know, if you think about it, there's just all these multiple tiers and, you know, you have to get, say, this many nights, but only if you, you know, when you fly, if you spend this many, many dollars on that flight, it's this point, et cetera. And I just think there's going to be a simplification and almost a, a flattening to some degree of the programs, just so they're more manageable, both for the companies as well as for the, um, for the consumers. And then the, the other sort of two elements on the programs that we've been thinking a lot about is one is just around the economic model. Um, you know, how are the programs funded? How are the fro- programs sustained when the majority of it was based on high volume business travelers? And that's how it, I think the economic model really supported it. When that goes away, how do you fund and what, how do you economically, you know, sustain and support a program? Mm-hmm. And then the last point I would make is around um, security and privacy. Um, if you stop and think about all the breaches over the last many years, many of them come from loyalty programs. And so you're going to really need to go back to my point about trust. You want to make sure that your loyal customers, your loyal travelers feel that they can trust that you're going to protect their consumer data and that the privacy laws are going to be honored and that, you know, everything's going to be secure. Um, before they really want to continue to engage. One of the words that gets used a lot, not only by yourself in your reports, but you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a widely used term, is uh, seamless experiences. So, two part question, really. Uh, the first one, I hope you'll answer quickly, because the second one, I think, is actually more interesting. Um, define a seamless experience first of all, and secondly. What are the what are the, the hurdles or challenges that travel brands have to create a seamless experience? So the seamless experience can you know be everything. It's really about not having to deal with many handoffs and all the different you know integrations being exposed to the consumer. But it's really starting from the beginning of the journey all the way to the end of the journey. And as the definition of the word seamless is, is you know moving through that journey without all those various bumps and breaks in the chain. Um, The hurdles and the challenges are, you know, one of the biggest things right now is that there's so much for travel companies to do to deliver against the expectations that consumers have. And so you could do all the marketing that we've just talked about. You can leverage all the data and, you know, claim to have a personalized experience, but if you don't deliver against that, then, then again, all your trust is going to be shattered. And so, you know, I think it's all about delivering against the promise. And the way to go about doing that is leveraging, um, really primarily, if you have to start with leveraging cloud technology to yep. make sure that you have all of that at your fingertips and you're able to enable the promises that you, you've made to your, you know, to your consumers. And yep. so that's everything about, you know, making sure that you have the infrastructure in place, making sure that you have the data analytics in place so that you can develop the insights to execute against the strategy or to execute against, you know, the promises that you're making. So, you know, for me, that's the most important thing that the travel companies need to get right. And again, you know, summarizing it is being able to deliver against your promises of a seamless experience, as opposed to just marketing and talking about a seamless experience. Yeah. One of the papers that you've released recently is all about the cloud technology part. And we'll put a link to that because it's terrific and it's really worth everybody reading. So uh, in our last five minutes now, Emily, I'm, I'm, I'm curious then, you know, Accenture and yourself are way too diplomatic to name any brands. But I'd like to get a sense of particular sectors, you know, who stands to lose, um, who stands to need the most help? And who stands to win quickly as we start to go through this year and think a little bit more kind of medium term? Yeah, it's a great question. And you're correct that I won't answer with a name of a company, but or companies. <laughs> but that being said, um, you know, we've been speaking a lot in Accenture, you know, and more broadly around the concept of compressed transformation. And really what that's about is that it's time to move as quickly as possible to get through this transformation journey because going sort of step-by-step, point-by-point over an extended period of time is just not an option right now in the wake of COVID-19. And so if I were to say who the winners are, 
the winners are going to be those who actually execute their compressed transformation in a, in a rapid manner, in a holistic manner, leveraging an ecosystem of partners, because there's so much change that needs to occur that they're not going to be able to get it done alone. And what I've seen over the years, particularly in the travel industry, but I, I would say it's broader, but I'm speaking about travel, is it's always been a very, um, let me do this little project right now. Let me address this challenge right now. Let me look at it. Let me watch it. Let me determine now what's next. Let me have a multi-year roadmap. And and it, it's just the time for that doesn't exist anymore in the environment that we're in. So it's it's really about the rapid execution of that transformation. And it comes back to what I said, leveraging the cloud, leveraging data analytics, you know, letter, leveraging, um, you know, your understanding of your consumers through targeted marketing. I'll frame it a different way then, if I can. Are there other, are there particular sectors that are ideally placed to continue that trans? formation or are there those that are just inherently because it's their technology or their legacy or whatever that it's a hard it's a it's a bigger challenge for them than others no i i think in travel relative to some of the other industries it's harder because of the antiquated technology that's existed so when yeah. i said you know there's been this history I, I think travel definitely has a bigger a bigger lift to do than many other industries yeah. not all other industries but then many others but I, I don't think that they're incapable of doing it by any means. I don't think there's going to be a loser. I think travel is going to come out of this stronger than ever. And, you know, I'm excited about I'm already seeing the return to growth. And um, I think they just need to execute against this compressed transformation approach. And they're going to come out ahead for sure. They may come out different. They may come out, you know, um, smaller in many ways, but smaller could become bigger. Um, because if you do it right and you identify all of your operational efficiencies and you become a much more agile company where you're able to react to the changes, because this isn't our last, unfortunately, this isn't our last crisis, right? So to learn from this and be ready and, and you know, to be able to be more agile and react to these changes, I think um, travels just as well poised as anybody to come out ahead. We talk a lot about, you know, this last year has given the industry a lot of time to reflect, look very inward about the way it operates, the way it behaves, whether it's around sustainability, whether it's around the way it treats its own employees, particularly with regards to diversity. Last question then really, Emily, is do you think the industry is going to be a better industry in the way it behaves going I forward? Do. Yeah, I do very it, much so. I optimistic kind of tone there from you, I sense. Yeah, no, I really do. I think that the industry's learned a lot. I think the world's learned a lot. We all as, as individuals have learned a lot. And I think that the industry has realized that there's a lot that needs to change. And then there's a lot that's been really good that needs to be capitalized on. You know, we're using within Accenture the phrase creative pragmatism. And that's what we're really, we believe in our narrative of what the industry needs to do is to have this creative pragmatism mentality which is there is change that needs to occur. There's no question about it, right? Yeah. The way things have been done for the past hundreds of years, it just can't sustain, especially in the new world that we're entering into right now. But there's been so much good that has occurred that you need to capitalize on that as well. And so, um, no, I, I'm extremely positive. I mean, maybe I'm also itching to travel and you know get back into the world. Um, not maybe, I definitely am. Um, but I'm, what I'm watching our clients do, I'd like to see them move a little bit quicker. Um, and I'd like to see, you know, the governments and, and all the jurisdictions make some decisions faster in line with what the travel, you know, to support what travel is trying to do to help get the world moving again. But I'm incredibly optimistic. Okay. It's nice to end on a happy note anyway. So thank you very much, Emily. We'll be back to you in a moment. So uh, this Future Proofing Travel Series, as I said at the beginning, is brought to you by uh, Travelport. Uh, it's a simpler, faster, or engaging for everyone. That's when we're talking about Travelport Plus. As I said, you can read our interview with Greg Webb, the CEO of Travelport, from a couple of weeks ago on focuswire.com. Uh, Travelport Plus is here to bring travel retail up to date and is ready for tomorrow. Again, Check that detail, check those details at travelport.com forward slash plus. That's travelport.com forward slash plus. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. We Great. really appreciate it. We have had a couple of questions with people asking, can they get hold of the papers? So are those freely available? Can we get those links? Yeah, let me take, I will take care of it maybe through you. 
we'll get everything to you and okay we'll, we'll, wonderful. we'll direct people to those papers because they're actually really interesting which is one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you in the first place so again Good. emily vice from accenture we really appreciate your time great we'll thank you for time. having me i enjoyed okay. the conversation and, okay and thanks everybody for tuning bye-bye in.